Prison and privileges. I think Paul must have been an interesting character and evangelist. In his writing, he starts well and then gets sidetracked, something that seems to happen quite often. Here in chapter 3, he starts well in verse 1, but soon goes off track from verses 2 to 13 and rejoins his thought in verse 14. Here, Paul is writing from Rome, where he is held prisoner. He is awaiting trial before Nero, and no doubt knowing his time is nearly to an end on this earth. You can see why he calls himself the prisoner of Jesus Christ, whereas really he was the prisoner of Nero. Yet he never saw himself as a prisoner of the Roman government, but rather suffering for the sake of Christ. He then adds a second descriptive phrase to indicate the nature and purpose of his imprisonment. He was Jesus Christ's prisoner on behalf of you Gentiles. This is true, for it led to his arrest in Jerusalem, his imprisonment there and in Caesarea, and then subsequent trials and appeal to Caesar, which had brought him to Rome. He travelled with his friend and travelling companion Luke, the doctor, the writer of Acts, who recorded everything in his book. Within Acts, we read what prompted the Jews to stir up the crowd against Paul, and the reason was because of his reputation for teaching men everywhere against the people and the law and this place, that being the temple. You have to wonder how he acquired such a reputation, and no doubt it was exactly because of what he taught in Ephesians 2, namely abolishing the divisive elements of the law. As Jesus was creating a new people and a new building, a new temple, so he was arrested. It was when he was on trial that he had said that Jesus said to him, Depart, I will send you away to the Gentiles. That they shouted, Away with such a fellow on the earth. To them, how could someone who was crucified have said such a thing? He had appealed to the emperor. And so to the emperor he had been committed to on trial. Now this prison is nothing like ours, for he is held in a house that he rented, where he was allowed visitors. However, he was chained to a soldier day and night. I wonder if we would see such imprisonment as a privilege rather than a penance. I wonder when we are undergoing hardship or material loss for the sake of Christian principles, do we see it as victims or champions for Christ? I wonder how Haley Young felt after her attack and later diagnosis. You see, a point of view can make all the difference in the world. So in this letter, in this section, Paul refers to the central part, which is that into his life there had come the revelation of the great secret of God. The secret was that love, mercy, and grace were not just meant for the Jews alone, but for all humankind. When Paul met the risen Christ on the road to Damascus, he received this revelation, and it was to the Gentiles that God had sent him. Acts 26, verses 17 to 18 says, I will rescue you from your own people, and from the Gentiles to whom I am sending you to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God, so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a place among those who are sanctified by faith in me. This was something new. Remember last week that I spoke of the Jewish hatred of the Gentiles. It was seen as useless and worthless so they thought in the sight of God. 
Can you imagine how they would feel being told that they were equal in God's eyes? Can you begin to understand why Paul faced such opposition? As a Jew, you knew you were God's chosen people. However, God, sorry, however, Paul is telling them and the Gentiles that they are fellow heirs, members of the same body and partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus. Paul uses three prefixes when explaining this new position. They are co-heirs, concorporate, part of a whole, and co-sharers of the promise through Christ Jesus. But think about this, if Paul had not made that discovery, there would not have been such a worldwide Christianity as we have today. I know Paul would disagree with me here, for he says that he was the recipient of a new revelation. He did, he did not discover it. No, it was God who revealed it to him. You see, truth and beauty are not humanity's discovery, but rather God's gift to us. Paul uses the word mystery three times in this opening paragraph. How the, this mystery was made known to me, verse 3. A reading of which will enable you to perceive my understanding of the mystery of Christ, verse 4. In former generations, this mystery was not made known to humankind, verse 5. Now, the English and Greek words do not mean the same. In English, a mystery is seen as something dark, secret even, and perhaps puzzling. Whereas in Greek, the word is different. It is still a secret, but also to something which a person has had revealed to them. This mystery refers to how the Gentiles became co-heirs and members of the same body and partakers in the promise in Christ through the gospel. So other than being the person receiving this new revelation, Paul saw himself as the transmitter of grace. When Paul met with the leaders of the church to talk over with them his mission to the Gentiles, he talks about the uncircumcision being committed unto him and he talks of the grace which was given unto me, Galatians 2, verse 7 and 9. When he writes to the Romans, he speaks of the grace that is given to me of God. Paul, Paul saw his life as being a channel of grace to humankind. He also saw himself as being a servant, as he says that he was made a servant by the free gift of the grace of God. He did not see it as a wearisome duty. He saw it as a privilege. So how do we see ourselves in service for God? Is it a privilege? Or is it a duty? Barclay says, it is often so very difficult to persuade people to serve the church to teach for God, to sing for God, to administer, to visit those in poverty, to give of our time, our strength, our money for God. He continues, To give is not a duty which ought to be coerced out of us. It is a privilege which we should regard as the gift of the grace of God. Paul also regarded himself as the sufferer for Christ. He did not expect the way of service to be trouble-free either. F.R. Maltby is quoted as saying, Jesus promised his disciples three things, that they would be absurdly happy, completely fearless, and in constant trouble. To suffer for Christ is not a penalty, it is our glory. For it is to share in the sufferings of Christ himself 
and it is also an opportunity to witness the reality of our loyalty to him. You would have thought that this revelation would have made Paul conceited, but he saw it as a double privilege. The privilege of discovering that all should be gathered into the secret of his grace and mercy, and that he had been given the privilege of making this secret known to the church. No, it made him humble and amazed that it should have been given to the least of God's people. However, there's one other thing to mention here. Sometimes the history of Christianity can be presented in such a way that it sounds as if the gospel went out to the Gentiles because the Jews rejected Jesus. But Paul reminds us that our salvation is not an afterthought by God or seen as something second best. No, the bringing together of all into his love was part of the eternal plan of God. You see, the major lesson taught in this first half of Ephesians 3 is the biblical centrality of the church. There are some people who make Christianity a relationship with Christ only and nothing to do with the church. Others may want to be part of it, but not willing to commit to it formally as a member or committed to regular attendance. Now all churches must be open to renewal and reform, and now all have such an opportunity before returning to these four walls. God has not abandoned his church. He is still building and refining it. So if God has not abandoned it, how can we? The church is part of his plan and has been throughout history. At school, I had to choose between geography and history, and geography won. Sadly, I cannot tell you our kings or queens or other events throughout history. But I know this, history is his story, God's story. For God is at work moving from a plan conceived in eternity to working out in history and then beyond time to eternity. The Bible tells us that the center of God's eternal historical plan is Jesus Christ together with his redeemed and reconciled people. If I had studied history, I would be taught about wars, battles, and peace treaties, followed by more wars, battles, and peace treaties. The Bible rather concentrates on war between good and evil, and the victory through Jesus Christ, victory over powers of darkness by peace treaty of his blood, for all who repent and believe. Secular history concentrates on the changing map of the world as one nation defeats another, increasing its territory and the rise and fall of empires. The Bible concentrates rather on a multinational community called the church, which has no territorial boundaries and claims nothing less than the whole world for Christ, and whose empire will never come to an end. Paul ends this section as he began, namely to a reference to his own sufferings in the Gentile cause. But he says, do not lose heart over from what I am suffering. It's suffering for you, which is to your glory. Throughout the New Testament, both suffering and glory go hand in hand. And Jesus himself said that it would, he would enter glory through suffering and that his followers would have to tread the same path. However, here, Paul says something different. He says that his sufferings will bring them his glory. You see, he is suffering in prison on their behalf as their champion, 
standing firm in this inclusion in God's new society. Well, I pray that we do not have to suffer as Paul, the apostle, did, or that of the disciples. Surely we too should be prepared to stand up for what we believe. Stand up to the task that is before us at Amesbury Baptist Church. Stand up to serve God, not only outside these four walls, but in service within them. At such a time as this, we should not be backing off, but rather standing firm and seeking that our church worship is more authentic, its fellowship more caring, and its outreach more compassionate. In other words, like Paul, we shall be ready to pray, to work, and if necessary, to suffer in order to turn the vision into a reality. I hope you are standing firm, and I hope you are standing with me. Amen.